the system as we know it's going to change. And the people pulling the strings are the most powerful in the world. When you have the BIS and the IMF standing behind these kinds of initiatives, one would think it's almost like that old adage, we're pushing for a one world currency. Everyone always thought that was impossible. How could that ever happen? Well, a one world system anyway that would be monitored instead of having a one world currency maybe everything is transacted over a cbdc network all of it integratable all of it um you know monitored if you will it almost serves the same purpose maybe they want this system maybe they with the, the world bank and you know klaus schwab type of agenda realize that this is what needs to be done in order to to maintain control and that can be a globalist agenda maybe all of these groups are wolves in sheep's clothing or you know the trojan horse i don't know no matter what that what they are talking about or hedging towards or moving towards is is a new system and does that mean the old system has to be reset so these this is a way for countries to push back against the west the mismanagement of the dollar the weaponization of the treasury to accumulate gold instead, which has doubled the performance of the 10-year treasury for 25 years with no counterparty liability, and, and not worry about all of these factors that seem to be accelerating quickly with the mismanagement of, of the dollar and the, and the treasury market. But how about option four? Just simply revalue the gold holdings if they really are there, the 8,330 metric tons that haven't been audited forever, and revalue it to a level that then makes our balance sheet balanced with you know the, the the liabilities with our now higher asset level and and it's a different game so beat them to the punch if you can't beat them join them but do it first you're saying that that's also on the table i would just simply say you put gold at one hundred and fifty thousand dollars an ounce as crazy as that sounds your balance sheet now is pristine gold will go to a level no one thinks possible and it will be pegged to a new system and never come down On the Spot with Michelle McCory is brought to you by Goldback, inflation-resistant 24-karat gold currency. Hello, I'm Michelle McCory. Thank you again for joining us. Russia is gearing up to host the 16th BRICS Summit in Kazan. Leaders from across the alliance will be coming together to discuss trade, monetary policy, and more. The core members of BRICS Plus are attending the summit with heads of states, presidents, and prime ministers representing China, India, Brazil, South Africa, the United Arab Emirates, Iran, Egypt, and Ethiopia. But this meeting goes well beyond the BRICS Plus members. Representatives from more than 30 prospective member nations like Turkey and Thailand are also expected to join the discussions. And one of the major topics on the agenda is a bold monetary initiative, a new alternative global currency system commonly referred to as the unit. The BRICS are also looking at a new global payment system, Project Embridge, and both are seen as a challenge to the US dollar and the dollar-dominated global trade system. Now, the unit will reportedly be fully collateralized, backed by 40% gold and 60% by currencies of participating countries. The BRICS are also actively exploring and using Embridge, a multi-central bank digital currency, or CBDC, platform developed by central banks in China, Hong Kong, Thailand, and the United Arab Emirates, and under the cover of the Bank for International Settlements, or BIS. And this is an alternative to the US-controlled SWIFT network to conduct cross-border payments and settlements, which Russia was kicked off of in 2022. Now, the BRICS countries are not only working on this new common currency and global payment system, they've also been actively trying to ditch the dollar. Member countries have been formalizing trade agreements using their own currencies instead of the dollar. The central banks of these countries have also been buying gold at record levels. And at the same time, they've been reducing their share of dollar reserves. According to the IMF, dollar reserves held by central banks have fallen to 57%. That's the lowest level in 25 years. So this BRICS meeting is being viewed as a very significant step in the bifurcation of the global monetary system. And my next guest has been ahead of the curve in spotting this trend. Here to discuss what we can expect from this upcoming BRICS meeting, what this all means for the global monetary system, the fate of the dollar, and your savings and investments is Annie Schechtman. 
Andy is the president and owner of Miles Franklin's Precious Metals. He has over three decades of experience in the precious metals sector and is a highly regarded expert on monetary history and the economy and a fan favorite here on Kitco. Andy, very good to have you back with us. Thank you, Michelle. I appreciate it. It's great to be here. Thanks for so, having Andy, me. Andy, it's always good to see you. But again, every time we connect, more of what you want would happen in our previous interviews comes to fruition. So I always speak to you with a little bit of trepidation. Mm -hmm. And Andy, you have long warned that we will see a change in the dollar denominated money order, that the dollar will lose its status as a global reserve currency and asset. Yep. You were very, very early to flag the trend of de-dollarization and that would accelerate following the excessive weaponization of the dollar. You correctly called the expansion of the BRICS and member countries formalizing bilateral trade agreements, not using their dollar, but their own currencies. You were spot on on that. You correctly called that central banks will be buying gold and buying gold at record levels. And you also correctly pointed out that we will see the demise of the petrodollar. And we are indeed seeing cracks there. We're seeing oil increasingly being sold in other currencies. So I'm not going to recap all of our previous interviews. We'll add the links to them. But I recall that, you know, you were really ahead of this trend. You noticed that the Bank of International Settlements, the Central Bank of Central Banks, made gold a tier one asset. That was a big turning point for you. Before we get into this BRICS meeting and what we can expect, give us a little bit of background. Give us a bit of a scene setter ahead of this background in medium level detail. Yeah, well, thank you for such a kind introduction. And honestly, Michelle, to me, it's spooky. I mean, it's spooky coming from the, the from the place of being a dad, you know, with three young kids, um, not so young anymore, but young enough in terms of, of their life is still ahead of them. And, and seeing these things unfold, as I have talked about in over 4,000 YouTube videos since 2019, is very scary. I, I've been doing this for a very long time and, and I've said a lot of things, a lot of which have come true because they're rooted in mathematics and economics, but they weren't as, they weren't a call like this was. But, you know, fairness, I think, is that the fact that I don't think you have to be incredibly astute to see the crumbs that are being laid at our feet. I think if I've had luck or success in anything really, it's been in putting these crumbs together, fashioning them, fashioning them in the in the shape of a cookie, if you will, taking these 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 crumbs, these this progression of events and putting them together in what is a linear trend, a trend that is moving in this direction. And it, it, it actually concerns me how fast it's all come together. But one of the things that as we talk about the meeting uh, one of the things that I think is important to understand, and you mentioned the Bank of International Settlements is standing behind Project Enbridge, the way that the Bank of International Settlements has done things, and I don't know if I'm reaching for this or not, but I'll give you, I guess, my take on this because it's interesting. It's interesting in the respect that in 2017, when the Bundesbank made a very public declaration after a few years of trying to get their gold back, from the West, from the New York Federal Reserve and the Bank of England, it was unusual. It was unusual because gold had been falling for six straight years and central banks had been selling gold. Now, why is the Bundesbank making such a big deal about this was my overwhelming thought. Like, why? What, what's the deal? But what became more interesting to me, exponentially more so, was that within weeks of this happening, the Bank of of, of Austria, Turkey, Hungary, Poland, the Czech National Bank, the Dutch National Bank, all of these banks followed suit, both with the New York Federal Reserve and, and the Bank of England. You see, forever, countries would hold their gold at the Bank of England and the New York Fed to give them access to the LBMA and to the COMEX, uh, Western jurisdiction safety and, and Western rule of law. Um, and then in 2018, after all of these banks bringing back their gold, which was strange enough, they all bought gold to the to the tune of more gold than combined than they did in the 60 years previously combined. Those those same banks bought more gold as a group than they did in the 60 years previously combined. They doubled that amount in 2019. And then I guess if you believe it was coincidence, uh, let's just say I don't. The BIS said, "Oh, by the way, y'all, gold is now a tier one asset." Now that. To me, it reeks of the fact that they were warned, get your gold, start buying it, bring it home. It's now tier one. 
on par with U.S. dollars and treasuries, the only tier one assets we've had since the end of World War II, at least in terms of central bank money. And so that's kind of the setup, if you will, for what we've seen lately as it pertains to the new settlement currency and Project Embridge, because one thing that's been very interesting that I've noticed, and just a simple Google search will show you that over the last year and a half, these are the banks and probably others that have openly brought their gold back from the Bank of England and the New York Fed. Germany, Austria, Slovakia, Argentina, the Netherlands, Saudi Arabia just a few weeks ago, Hungary, Hungary, Belgium, Egypt, Senegal, Romania, Nigeria, Poland, Ghana, India. That's an interesting one. They had 100 metric tons at the Bank of England. They brought that home. It's been there since 91. And they bought one and a half times the amount of gold that they bought all of last year, just within the first four months of this year, brought all that home too. Why are they bringing it home? Turkey, France, Serbia, Venezuela, Algeria, Cameroon, South Africa, Czechoslovakia, the list goes on. But all of these central banks brought all of their gold home. Now, conventional wisdom will tell you that's because of the weaponization of the treasury market. These banks, you know, you remember where Venezuela asked their gold to be re returned from the Bank of England, and they said, ah, no, not, not going to do that. We don't like the way that you're running your country. We're going to keep it. So that's conventional wisdom, and I, I understand that that's probably part of it, but if you look deeply at the new proposed settlement currency, the unit, which I know we'll get into, it talks about that these countries are able to mint this new settlement token using the gold held within their own borders. In other words, the gold will not need to be sent to Moscow, to Beijing, to Dubai, to a central authority as the West has done it forever. And, and now each and every one of these countries will be able to hold their gold within their own borders. And we'll get deeper into that as we speak. So I think as we, we look at this from, from you know, a mile high, I would say the BIS does things this way. The BIS will tell the, the, the parties involved, get your house in order, start doing this because things are about to change. And you missed one other very, very important part of Project Embridge. You are right. It was designed by China, Hong Kong, Thailand, and the UAE and backed by the BIS Innovation Hub. But the fifth full member now is Saudi Arabia. And this is a platform that is not compatible with U.S. dollars. So to see Saudi Arabia become a full participant in Project Embridge with up to 25 or 30 observational is a very big deal. And the crumbs are leading us down this path that we'll talk about. So, yeah, I think this is, this is let's call it a quickening, if you will, an acceleration of this, this movement, of this de-dollarization and into a new system that potentially could indeed be backed by gold. And uh, I know we'll talk more about that, but yeah, it's um, from what I saw back then, this is just another progression of events using the same parties and, and the same methodology of, it just seems as though they're being clued in on what's coming and they are proactively preparing and the right. BIS is behind this just like they were back then too. Again, we're going to get into the details uh, of Project Embridge and the unit. But before we do that, I want you to help us set the scene in terms of the members, in terms of the driving factors. We know that Russia is chairing this year's summit. At China's President Xi, he's coming in person. India's Prime Minister Modi, they're attending. We've got heads of states of all of the other BRICS plus countries coming to Russia, you know, dismissing the fact that Russia has been ostracized by the West. On the contrary, this has accelerated this process. We've also got all of these other countries wanting membership. Turkey, for one, has applied for membership. Turkey is part of NATO. So that's a very interesting country to be pitching up for BRICS membership as well. Help us set the scene of the weaponization of the dollar due to excessive sanctions, how we've seen these trade alliances form with countries ditching the dollar, opting to use their own currencies, and how we've seen the expansion of this group, which you quite rightly called, which now I believe makes up over 36% of global GDP. So paint that picture for us. Yeah, I mean, I mean, if we take a step back, we can look at the Belt Road Initiative, China's effort to to industrialize all of these under-industrialized countries, which represents 75 percent of human population, as is 50 percent of global GDP. And I think it's fair to mention that every one of the OPEC countries are on the Belt Road. And this is kind of what got me 
walking down this path. And if we look at a country then who has chosen to weaponize the treasury market the way that we have, it's important to look at it from the other side, right? And, you know, you, you would never want to go to, to court with an attorney for when you're being accused of murder who only listens to what you have to say and doesn't acknowledge the the plaintiff's case. That doesn't matter. We don't we don't need to know. That's that's not the, the smart way of doing things. So look at it from the other side. We're a country who invaded Iraq under false pretenses 20 years ago, looking for weapons of mass destruction that were never found. We're sorry. We're sorry we destroyed your country. We've toppled your regime. And here we are 20 years later still occupying the country. And and they made $90 billion last year in oil revenue, which is held at the New York Fed. And they asked at the end of 23 for a billion dollars. Please give it to us. We need it for something. No, we said, it's yours, but come back next year. Uh, it's just not a good time. This hypocrisy is being viewed by many countries like Iraq to the extent that they have formally applied to BRICS. They have they are kicking Western coalitions out, uh, coalition forces out of the country as we speak. Uh, they have made trading in dollars illegal. If you own a business, they will will throw you in jail and, and confiscate your business. And as of January earlier this year, there are no green bills in any bank throughout all of the country. Or you can look at it at Janet Yellen earlier in this year telling CNN, listen, I'm OK with Xi Jinping and Putin being buddies. My initial thought was, well, geez, that's that's really nice of you, Madam Secretary, she says. But but. If, if Xi gives one penny to the Russian war machine, we will sanction their banks, we will sanction their companies, and we will sanction Beijing itself. And I guess my thought is, well, what about the 200 plus billion we've given the Ukraine with no congressional oversight, the Stinger missiles, the F-16s, and the training of their pilots in the Arizona desert? Does that not matter? Evidently, it doesn't as the world reserve currency. So all I am saying is that a good portion of the world represent or sees the fact that or thinks that we are hypocritical now when you take five billion in russian assets and and call it what it is it's stealing it's default and use the majority of those assets to to buy weapons from the military industrial complex to give to the country they're in the midst of a war against well you don't come back from that at least as far as i'm concerned you will forever have severed the trust and even Putin said in a meeting in St. Petersburg a few weeks ago that the Bretton Woods system is dead, and it is. It's now replaced by a system that is backed simply by the trust of the United States. You could say the full faith and credit of a country that's 200 plus trillion in debt. And well, I don't need to go down the faith road. We've talked about that before, you know, the lawlessness and the judicial system, the electoral system and all that. And the trust. Where is the trust? We have, in many respects, squandered that trust by doing these kinds of things. And this is what has created this drive, this unified force of countries pushing back against this hegemony, which I would argue is dead. The supremacy isn't, but the hegemony is. And they're finding safety in numbers. And you're right. It is not only, however, the weaponization, but it's also the mismanagement of the world reserve currency. Yeah. We are a country that is now creating a $100,000 of debt per second. One, mm -hmm. two, three, four, and keep on going. So you destabilize the currency, you destabilize the country from within, you weaponize the dollar. And let's not forget, we signed an executive order to go green. I'm sure that doesn't make the Saudis happy. So yeah, all this stuff put right. together becomes a whole lot more relevant than each and every one of them in and of themselves. And as we've discussed on prior interviews, a faith in the United States, not only internationally, but also domestically, also from within, people are starting to question a lot of the institutions, a lot of the government data. Just faith in the system is crumbling due to gross mismanagement. On this expansion of this alliance, before we get into the details of the currencies and Project Enbridge, do you expect an expansion at this meeting, given you were so correct in calling it at previous meetings? Do you expect other I countries to be I announced? Don't, I don't know. I mean, look, there was a meeting that was held in Novograd that coincided with the G7 meeting. And interestingly enough, the Saudis were invited to the G7 meeting. They turned it down and instead sent their de delegates to the BRICS meeting in Novograd. And you get different numbers from different news sources. But from this article, it said as many as 59 countries have thrown their hat into the ring. Other news sources will tell you that they are pausing on reintegrating more and more countries into the BRICS to get all of their these, these, these things, these, these forces uh, that are, are pulling in different directions, to get everything aligned and tight 
I think what we will see, whether or not we see more countries that have been formally admitted, which I suspect there will be some, we will get a, an acknowledgement of just how many countries indeed are planning on joining. And and maybe it isn't announced in, in next week, or maybe it's announced throughout the year, or maybe even next year in Brazil. But what I think is undeniable is that there is a massive growing chorus of countries that are finding interest in exactly what the BRICS are standing for, and, and that is a multipolar world instead of a unipolar world, mm -hmm. one that is all about um, having the chance to stand up for themselves instead of being subservient to the West. And I guess if I had to answer candidly, I would say yes, I think there is a probability that we will see some admission by a few countries, uh, maybe not the big group that uh, they've talked about, 30, 40, 50 that have expressed interest, but I think we'll see some that are admitted and that being a primary focus moving forward. In fact, if you look at what Brazil is is talking about for their, when they take over the, the chair on January 1, it is integrating other countries into the system. So it's coming, whether it's announced next week or not, I don't know how important that is. Just know that more and more countries are wanting to do just this and that is throw their hat into the ring. Right. I mean, the status of the Saudis is still unclear. As we've said, they've sort of been hedging their bets, straddling both sides there, um, sort of one foot in, one foot out, keeping good ties with the United States and the West. But, you know, Turkey's apparently applying for membership. Turkey's a NATO country. Russia is the whole idea behind NATO. How would that work? I mean, surely you can't be in NATO and part of BRICS, I would think. Uh, probably not. Well, they applied for the European Union and they were turned down. You could say the same thing about, about Hungary, who really hasn't been welcomed into the European Union. And, and although they haven't formally expressed, at least I haven't seen, that they are formally applying to BRICS, these are the choices that will have to be made. And yeah, it's a big deal that, that Turkey, a NATO member, is indeed formally applying to BRICS. And, and I think choices and sides will have to be made, um, yeah. self-serving, every country for themselves. But right. yeah, it, it's, it's rather interesting. And you talk about Saudi Arabia, they are hedging, you know. They bought a 160 metric tons of gold that they are supposed to report to the IMF, and they didn't. In other words, I think reportedly, right? Well, and and it was flagged by the Swiss import export numbers, and these are countries that are quietly de-dollarizing. Not to you could say the same thing about India. They're kind of hedging their bets too, one foot in, one foot out. And I think until we see this solidity, until we see critical mass. It's, it's probably wise to do that, to play right. both sides, to not anger the West at the same time, you know, um, not, not do anything to disrupt their ability to integrate into the BRICS. And if I had to guess, just looking at the G7 meeting where Saudi Arabia declined an invitation but sent their delegates to the BRICS meeting, if that doesn't say a lot, I don't know what does, as is joining the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, the BRICS New Development Bank, the overtures that they are making with their actions betray their rhetoric. And so I would yeah. say that they're more in than out, just not formally declared. And Andy, as you've mentioned on previous interviews, a pivotal moment for the Saudis was the withdrawal from Afghanistan and the debacle that that was and the weakness projected on the world stage for the Biden-Harris administration through that move, which uh, made the Saudis really reconsider their military alliances there. Um, let's get into the nitty gritty now of this common currency, the unit. There's a white paper that's been released according to this. Um, it's going to be called the unit. It's supposed to be pegged, I believe, 40% to gold and 60% to a basket of BRICS national currencies. Talk us through that. How would this work? Well, so what opened my eyes to this for... And, and the reason I've spoken so much about a common settlement currency, Michelle, is that Sergey Glazyev has told us this four years ago when I really jumped on this story and started Sergei saying publicly, this being is the, the, the Russian. Uh, yes, the finance minister of the, the Eurasian Economic Union and a Russian finance minister who basically said this is the path that the BRICS are heading down. It will be a basket, he said back then of BRICS plus currencies. He's right on that. And a basket of commodities. Not so right on that, but kind, but kind of. And, and so keep in mind what I said about the BIS and the repatriation of gold and all of this stuff as we continue down this pathway. But there was a meeting, that meeting in, in, in Novograd that coincided with the G7 meeting. And 
what came out of it, there were three things that, that caught my attention. One, we are told that 59 countries have expressed interest. 59. Two, Delma Rousseff. Now, Delma was the former president of Brazil, and Delma is now the, um, the head of the BRICS New Development Bank. And she said, look, we had two meetings on the sidelines with Putin and Glaziev, and in principle, we have agreed to the unit settlement token, which is to be traded over Project Embridge. Well, let's start with Project Embridge before we get to the unit, because it's very important. And Project Embridge is something I've talked about on many podcasts for over a year. And it is a cross-border payment system, as mentioned, designed by China, Hong Kong, Thailand, and the United Arab Emirates. They have done test trades. And it's ironic that the first two test trades they have done, China paying in digital yuan, uh, to the United Arab Emirates, first for oil, the second for gold. I would argue and have for a long time that gold and oil have been remonetized. You look at, at Iran awarding China a, a contract for a few billion dollars to modernize their biggest airport, paying for it in oil. You look at a lot of these trades that China is doing around the world, paying for oil, for example, in their digital yuan bond or the petro yuan bond, which is immediately convertible into gold on the Shanghai Gold Exchange, which is what? but the only tier one asset next to U.S. dollars and treasuries backing a new system, perhaps. Well, according to Delma Rousseff, that basket, 40% will be gold, not commodities. And in principle, she said, we've agreed to it. This is a big deal. But it says that Project Embridge will allow all of the countries to trade in local currencies. And if we go back to the meeting in in Johannesburg that everyone was so upset that there wasn't a common settlement currency issued, what did they tell us? We're going to go back to the drawing board and talk about a common settlement currency. They never really said a common currency, but a common settlement currency. And in the meantime, let's trade in local currencies. And we've seen that. Look at Russia and and um, uh, Russia and India as an example, and and or Russia and China. Uh, they're almost a hundred percent of their trades are in their local currencies, and you know China buying. Um, corn or soybeans from Brazil paying for it in, in yuan, which is immediately convertible into gold on the Shanghai Gold Exchange. They're not settling in dollars. That's the first thing we saw. And, and, and what she says is that Project Embridge will indeed allow all of these countries to trade with one another in their local currencies, which is a big deal. And in fact, if we talk about central bank digital currencies and you take the gross domestic product of the world, all of it, 99% of it, and the countries that comprise 99% of it, all have CBDCs in development or operation. So it will allow all of these BRICS members to trade amongst themselves in their own central bank digital currencies. That's first and foremost, right? That's how they will transact. But if at a certain point that becomes a problem, maybe there's too much of an imbalance. Maybe I don't want your currency. Maybe I want something else. And that something else is the unit settlement token, which is 60% BRICS plus currencies and 40% gold. And that is a really, really big deal because if we go back to all of the countries that have repatriated their gold, what we see is that the gold that will be used to mint these tokens, these settlement tokens, and the currency will be able to be held within the jurisdiction of the countries that possess the gold. So all of this repatriation of gold, many think is about the weaponization of the dollar. Well, what did the BIS do last time? They told all these countries to load up on gold and to repatriate it and then bang, it's tier one. Well, is there any coincidence, do you think, to the 40 plus countries that have brought all of their gold home and now we are being told that the new unit settlement token will be gold held within the borders of the countries that possess it? I don't. In fact, I think it will be huge. And in fact, all of the items in the unit reserve basket, the 60% currency, the 40% gold, must be freely tradable in gold terms for spot delivery at one of the unit nodes. And so what you have here is a situation where the countries will maintain their own monetary autonomy. They will have to take good care of their economic house to keep it in good standing, to trade with one another, to have it part of the unit ecosystem. But in the end, it will be the pegging of gold, that 40% pegging, which indeed will, um, which will give validity to the entire system that isn't really dependent upon any one central 
authority. And it's a, a very big deal as far as I'm concerned. You put it together with its reclassification as tier one, its massive acquisition by the central banks, and its, its um, repatriation by all of these players. And then you see Saudi Arabia as the fifth full participant in Embridge, realizing it's not compatible with U.S. dollars. Again, do you have to be particularly astute to wonder what does that have in store for dollar accumulation, which is being eviscerated to the tune of $100,000 in debt per second or a trillion in debt every 90 days? And I always say to you, what's a trillion seconds but 31,688 years ago? We're destroying the dollar. So these, this is a way for countries to push back against the West, the mismanagement of the dollar, the weaponization of the treasury, to accumulate gold instead, which has doubled the performance of the 10-year treasury for 25 years with no counterparty liability, and, and not worry about all of these factors that seem to be accelerating quickly with the mismanagement of, of the dollar and the, and the treasury market. Right. I mean, that's uh, a lot of very important highlights that you've uh, hit on there. According to the white paper, this uh, common unit of account, as you touched on, would indeed solve the problem of exchange rate volatility that occurs when cash balances accumulate from settlements in national currencies. Um, and it's interesting that they really emphasize that this will be a political money, as it's described in the paper. According to that, the digital token is designed to be a political currency, a solution to lack of trust, uh, stemming from the politicization of the use of a single global currency. So in other words, you know, the US dollar there. And no one currency is expected to represent more than 30% of the collateral basket. So I guess that in some way reduces concerns of Chinese dominance in, in the network. So break down this idea of a political money, because one of the biggest arguments against this has been nobody wants China to take the lead. You know, you've got too many member countries. They're going to be jockeying for position and for power. Uh, you know, too many chefs uh, spoil the broth, as they say. D does this now address those concerns, the way they've structured yeah. this? For sure. I mean, what you have is, is, is preservation and, and accentuation of national sovereignty, independent monetary policies of the countries um, where the, the ones that, that employ policies most beneficial to domestic growth and price stability, running a good economic ship, this benefits them the most. And it is apolitical in the respect that you can't have any more than 30% of any one currency in this basket, and which is really very similar to the way that the BRICS are running their affairs. It was in, the presidency was in South Africa last year, it's in Russia this year, it's in Brazil next year. This is a, this is a, a, a deal about um, cooperation and a, volunteer, a, a voluntary one at that. Uh, this is not a, a, a one entity rules the roost the way that the West has for five centuries. And I, I just think that this is exactly what will make it work in the respect that there isn't one common currency, but a common settlement currency, that all of it is tied to its value in gold, right? So everything that comprises the basket has to be tied to a physical weight in gold. And so you end up removing the variabilities of each and every one of the, the currencies that these countries have on their own. And it doesn't there isn't any one central authority that can dominate, if you will, not only in political structure of the BRICS itself, but in this settlement currency, it's very inclusive. And it, each unit token represents a proportionate fraction of the, the entire stock, if you will. So it, 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 there won't be distortions in any of the tokens that are issued either. The rebalancing, if you will, occurs within the, the base and it is a mirror reflection in a proportional amount on all of the tokens that are issued. So the base rebalances, but never the gold price, just the currencies, if you will, in their relation to gold. And so if there is a rebalancing, it reflects the exact rebalancing in the tokens that are issued. But what it all comes down to is that those tokens have to be, if, if indeed they want to, those tokens have to be able to be um, redeemable at a unit node for spot delivery 
well, a so, goal. So, and and so that's let, really the key let, to all let's of Let's break that down. So you're saying that there is reverse uh, convertibility. You could walk in to a bank and redeem your unit token for golden currencies? Or, or, or a no. nation could, because this is not this is not on the individual level yet, right? So when Correct. we say back, a nation could, a, a nation could, right? This is not just to be clear, and we'll get into it. This is not for citizens to interact with. This is not uh, the peer-to-peer -peer sort of transactional currency that was going to be used within the countries. But you're saying that on a national level, when we say backed by gold, China, for example can go and redeem its unit uh, from India for gold and currencies, like physically redeem the token for gold? Or, or is I'll that... I'll read it verbatim here. Verbatim, it says, we define the fractal unit, the unit token, as a fungible monetary transactional element of the unit ecosystem, representing a share of the total unit reserve basket consisting of 40% gold and fiat currencies freely convertible into gold. A... a a self-similar basket is present at each node of the fractal network, while the value of assets at all nodes add up to the total value of the unit reserve basket, all measured in gold. All items in the unit reserve basket, here's the key, must be freely tradable in gold terms for spot delivery at one of the unit nodes. If the condition of price discovery, free price discovery in gold terms is not satisfied, the currency cannot be deemed suitable for the unit reserve basket. So, yes, it is redeemable for those entities, the central banks that want to indeed redeem it for gold. If indeed that's what they want to do, they can do so. And that's a very big deal here. So uh, what it does is, is it, it, it is pegging everything to gold, which instead of having the variability in exchange rate, which is a very big deal when you're trading and have to convert to another currency first, this removes all of that and it's just pegged all of it to gold, and if I want to take the gold, I all of this has to be redeemable into gold at one of the unit nodes, and I think that is what makes it so genius. And it's it's not about who's got the strongest currency; it's about all of this in terms of the only other tier one reserve asset in the world, gold, backing this system, providing that immutability, that veracity, that that trust, that from a system that completely lacks trust. And that's where the blockchain comes into it, right? Help our viewers understand when we say node, what this means, because this, the unit's gonna run on a blockchain, so a distributed digital ledger where the individual notes uh, record transactions. So that ensures the security and integrity of the network, but uh, it's not permissionless. It's not like anybody can go in there. It's, there's still a centralized authority from my understanding that can allow participation or cut off access. It's not like, you know, Bitcoin, uh, for example, which is a private, permissionless, and, and decentralized. So, explain, you know, when we say unit node, what that means, how the whole blockchain idea fits into this. Well, it says the exact composition of the unit reserve basket at any time is public knowledge and broadcast by all unit nodes. So, it is a, it is a distributed ledger that is is public knowledge for people to see exactly what is the, the composition of the, the basket. And each one of the units are a fractal portion of the basket. And this is the whole idea behind Project Enbridge is to have to have a, a marriage, if you will, between blockchain technology and, and gold, if you will, to provide um, transparency to a system that has none. So yes, it, it will be open for everyone to see exactly what is in the basket. What is it comprised? So if you look at a node, it is just a fractal, you know, a, a the exact composition of, of the basket only in a fractional amount. And therefore, when if there's any rebalancing in currency value, it's done in the whole basket and then immediately it rebalances the, 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 the nodes, the tokens, if you will. So you don't have to rebalance the tokens all the time. It's, it's done in one central pie, but it's for everybody to see. And if, if the country wants to mint their own token, they take a portion, or they take the gold and they take the currency and they put them in escrow accounts within their own border, which is independently audited continuously for veracity but it's held within their own borders. So they don't have to send their gold 
to Beijing or to, to Moscow or to Dubai. It's held within their own borders and independently audited. They make their own tokens. But it is there are very strict penalties for not adhering to the ecosystem, and that's why they have a, a, an organization, and it's inside the, the paper. If I were to scan it here, I could find which what's the name of it, but they will independently and continuously audit these nodes to make sure that they are in compliance, and they have penalties involved for it as well. So, but yeah, all of it will be open for the people to see. Again, I guess, this is I mean, a, d- doesn't who audits the nodes then sort of give more power to one country or one group of countries over another? I guess in theory you could say that, um, but indeed I mean, it is kind of supposedly rotating, rotating a system. I guess that uh, I would think that they like would the address chairman. that, but it has to be independent. And I guess you know I don't think that there, it would behoove anyone to mess with the integrity of the right. system because you get kicked out of the system and that's the last thing that you want to do and there are very stiff penalties and they talk about it inside the white paper I'm not exactly sure at the top of my off the top of my head exactly what those penalties are but they're severe and and so to maintain the integrity of it they have an independent auditing uh, group that will continuously audit and i guess those audits would also be part of what we see on embridge for everybody to see There's nothing to hide at this point. On the blockchain. And, you know, uh, one of the issues that has always come up is like there's distrust amongst the BRICS countries themselves, let alone the BRICS plus countries. You know, they don't really trust each other. So uh, I suppose that, you know, this sort of auditing system and the penalties that come with that may help alleviate those concerns or at least that major pushback against this uh, unit and Project Embridge being successful. I I just want to re-emphasize this point because I think it's very important for our viewers. Now, the unit is not at this point intended to replace local currencies or become legal tender in any country. Is that correct? correct? That is correct. So it's only amongst nation states. So what happens on on the local level? On the, you know, are are people in India still using rupees? Are they using a a central bank digital currency version of rupee? How how does that work then? What's the that is the idea is that we are moving to a to a yes. They will all maintain their own. I would I would like to emphasize this is a central bank digital currency, and with all of this transparency come all of those concerns of lack of privacy and oversight and. Um, you know, complete obliteration of anonymity in every transaction being seen and potentially, you know, even being programmable. But this is still at the national level. This is not impacting individual citizens, at least not at this point. That's correct. Yeah. And I think, you know, it, it, it becomes, I think, fairly obvious that we're moving towards a CBD system when you see all of the countries 99% of them that comprise the the GDP of the world are, all have a CBDC in operation. Uh, the number two at the White House in terms of economic policy, Lael Brainerd, who was number two at the Fed and worked at the Treasury, she designed the CBDC in the United States when she was working at the Boston Fed uh, with MIT. And so, you know, everyone from the United States to all of these countries have a CBDC either in development or some of them already have them in operation. And ultimately, that is, I believe, where we are going. Now, I guess you could have a two-tier system until it's fully integrated, where you have the current system of currency, the way that we have it now, along with the digital system, kind of like they rolled out in China, where it wasn't mandatory. It's not mandatory. You you can trade the digital you want, or you can have the, the you want in its current form. But you know, you put the, the camel's nose under the tent and all of these things start to move in that direction. So I think it's it's implementation that starts at the highest level. It's kind of like when the United States rolled out um, FATCA. Uh, they started by going to all of the banks of, 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 the, of Europe in particular, Switzerland, and we used to do lots with the Swiss banks. And they said, you need to tell us every one of the people in, in your system, Americans that have bank accounts, because we think a lot of them aren't filing it on their tax form. And you have 90 days to do so, or we're going to, you know, uh, we're going to kick you out of SWIFT. Well, 
all the Swiss banks sent letters to all of my clients and said, you got 60 days to get your money out of our bank. We don't want you anymore. Well, now FATCA is part of everyone's um, daily life here in the United States if you do anything outside the United States. But that was before they came to the people in the country. They went to the banks first. Same thing here. I think they're setting up the infrastructure first, knowing that ultimately everyone is moving in that direction towards the CBDC. But these things don't have to happen all at once, but I think there is a progression in tandem that they are happening. They start at the top and they work their way down to the lowest common denominator, and that's you and I. Every one of us will at some point most likely have to transition to a CBDC. That is the way the world is moving, And but to get it done right, you have to stop start at the top. And, you know, that's an interesting point because that, in a way, sort of eliminates pushback, at least initially, from, you know, average citizens. Uh, you know, obviously, CBDC, ultimate tool of control and surveillance, but, you know, the people on the ground aren't going to be immediately impacted by it. So they're not going to be pushing back against this uh, first phase of the transition. And then, as we've said before, then it's too late. It's part of the system. And uh, there's really not much that you can do about it when it's more and more entrenched. Uh, Andy, let's talk about how this actually the works on on the state level with the existing current banking systems uh is it complementary to existing infrastructure like what happens there considering we do already have some banking systems that are running things pretty smoothly does this work within that is it a completely separate system how how does that play out well it, it, it talks about how it is highly integratable um, and you could see other systems integrate into Embridge. The United States has something called Project Agora, I believe, which is their their version of this, although it hasn't. there's not a lot of information on it, and they haven't really talked a lot about it. But indeed, it would integrate with the Project Embridge. And, and you know, you know, Christ- Kristalina Georgieva, the head of the IMF, has talked a lot about CBDCs, said a CBDC not backed by something would be fiat, makes sense then to use gold just like uh, Embridge and the unit would. And But yes, it would integrate into the current system. In fact, they make a very big point of saying that Embridge is highly integratable with other already uh, in operation systems. So yeah, I, I think that that is something that certainly they've thought of and it will certainly integrate with other CBDCs, no question about it. Um, what role will the United States and, and the G7 play in this? Who knows? But when you have the BIS and the IMF standing behind these kinds of initiatives, one would think it's almost like that old adage, we're pushing for a one world currency. Everyone always thought that was impossible. How could that ever happen? Well, a one world system anyway, that would be monitored instead of having a one world currency, maybe everything is transacted over a CBDC network, all of it integratable, all of it, um, you know, monitored, if you will, it almost serves the same purpose. So, yes, there will be no problem to integrate the current systems. Now, I don't know if SWIFT would integrate into it or they would have any desire to integrate SWIFT, which, in fact, why would they? They're pushing away from it. But a system like Project Agora, some people look at things like XRP, uh, whether or not whatever your opinion is on that, things like that would be integratable into Project Embridge. And, and so that is something that they talk an awful lot about in the um, uh, the Bank of International Settlement report on Project Embridge. You know, you bring up an interesting point, right? And the Bank of International Settlements, I mean, that's that's a European organization. Most of the, the central banks certainly founded, uh, it's in Switzerland, headquartered in Switzerland. Like why... Granted, Switzerland is neutral um, and always hedges its bets. But why would a heavily European uh, organization be facilitating this? It seems contrary to their interests. I think you reach a point where you realize you're too far down the rabbit hole, that you've, you've, you've gone too far in this system to really continue it at some point it runs out of track and with the massive debt accumulation that the west has has um, accumulated you'd wonder if they realize what we talk about all the time hypothetically that 
something has to change. And maybe this is their, maybe they're not as friendly to the United States in, in, in the way that we think of the United States as we are. Maybe they want this system. Maybe they, with the, the World Bank and, you know, Klaus Schwab type of agenda, realize that this is what needs to be done in order to, to maintain control. And maybe they are behind these things. Maybe, you know, not all is, is as we think. But the bottom line I take away from it is that the system as we know it's going to change. And the people pulling the strings are the most powerful in the world. And whether or not we think that it doesn't make sense that they would push back against Western ideals, maybe they realize that Western ideals are the hindrance to what they're trying to achieve. And so you have to reset the system to issue something that allows them to have their control, that they want control of money. And um, and that can be a global agenda, a globalist agenda. Maybe all of these groups are wolves in sheep's clothing or, you know, the Trojan horse. I don't know. And it right. is an interesting point. But I do think, indeed, that it just seems to me, no matter what, that what they are talking about or hedging towards or moving towards is is a new system. And does and, that mean the old system has to be reset? Maybe. And, you know, we've talked about this before, how potentially, you know, some of this is, is by design. And when you say a globalist agenda is not aligned with true Western values, at least what they're supposed to be, granted they've been distorted of late, but true American values of liberty, freedom, freedom of expression, Again, uh, granted, we're in very challenging times where some would question to what degree those values are still being upheld. Mm -hmm. But you're saying that because we're seeing cooperation from the likes of the BIS and at least support of the general structure from the IMF, that instead of your one world currency, which as we've discussed on this show with other guests, as well as with you as part of the World Economic Forum agenda and this globalist agenda, that this is perhaps a one world system, if not one currency at first, a one world system. Is that Yeah, doesn't it almost achieve the same thing? Yeah, I think it is. And it almost achieves the same thing. Um, yes. And I think that's kind of a, a workaround where people haven't really thought about that. They're thinking a one world currency and maybe that doesn't happen, but a one world system certainly would almost achieve exactly the same thing. And, and when you talk about the American ideals, I mean, you have to ask yourself, how the hell are the things that are happening in this country happening? The, the Cloward Piven theory, the mass, you know, 25 million people in this country illegally who they're trying to give the right to vote, the lawlessness in the cities. The rest of the world questions the, authentic, the authenticity of our elections and our judicial system, whether people think this or not, who are watching this, much of the world does. And that not that the same thing? I mean, perception is reality until you know better. But what my, my point with all this is I think a lot of the people around the world who, who would normally be pulling for the United States and a lot of people in this country are asking themselves, what the hell's happened to the place I grew up in? You know, why are we woke? Why are we destroying the nuclear family? Why are we letting our immigration system be destroyed and, and people unvetted pouring into the, into the country and apartment buildings being taken over in Colorado and all of this stuff? It's bizarro world. Well, it almost, it almost all fits together. And I think it does. And when you realize the lead economic advisors, I've talked about this with you on our last show, advocates for losing the reserve status, and then you see Vance say, well, maybe being the world reserve currency isn't such a great thing after all. You start to wonder, I mean, how much of this stuff is connected? How much is coincidence? But I will tell you that more troubling than any of the mismanagement of the currency, the weaponizing of the dollar, all of that stuff would be manageable if our country still had its ideals in place. But our culture is being whitewashed right out from underneath us and I find that to be more scary than anything. But if you are trying to reset the system, that's part of it. You, you destabilize what made this country great and what incentivized people for years to want to invest in this country. And now they look at it as, as, as you know, a, a lab experiment gone bad, maybe. I don't know. But I think it's all part of the same problem. Well, 
let's talk about the response to this because you know when you first brought uh this concept up to me i always used to say i don't imagine you know the us like rolling over and saying okay I, even though you have made some points in the past which you've substantiated that there could be factions within the us that actually want this uh someone that's been pushing against this uh is former president trump He's actually one of the few politicians that's actually been vocal about this. It's amazing how little coverage this whole uh, BRICS common currency is getting and on the mainstream media. That's this even not even been mentioned by, by many politicians. But former President Trump, um, who of course, as we know, is running to be the next president, he's acknowledged that the dollar is losing its reserve currency status, and that's a huge problem. Uh, it's, it's akin to losing a, a war. He's one of the few politicians to be very vocal about this, uh, saying that it is the equivalent of losing a war and that the U.S. needs to push back against de-dollarization. I want to play some clips of uh, former President Trump speaking, uh, a montage of some of his sentiments about this idea. Most recently, he was speaking at the Economic Club of Chicago made similar comments at the Economic Club of New York at a rally in Wisconsin, also previously on CNBC. Let's play this montage and get your thoughts on the other side. If a country tells me, uh, sir, we like you very much, but we're going to no longer adhere to being in the reserve currency, uh, we're not going to uh, salute the dollar anymore, I'll say that's okay. And uh, you're going to pay a 100% tariff on everything you sell into the United States, and we love your product. I hope you sell a lot of it into the United States, but you're going to pay 100 percent tariff. Uh, he will then follow it up by saying, sir, it would be an honor to stay with the reserve currency. I will be that will be like just playing. That's not even chess. That's checkers. But you don't have other. Listen to this. You don't even, you don't have other people that can talk that way. We have to continue to have that be the world currency. I think it's important. I think it would be losing a war if we lost. If we lost the dollar as, a, as the world currency, I think that would be the equivalent of losing a war. That would make us a third world country, and we can't let it happen. One of the things that we have with tariffs is that I'll say to them, you don't honor the dollar as your world currency. Is that right? You're not going to do it? No, we're not. I said, that's okay. I'm going to put tariffs all over your product. And they're going to say, sir, we'd love to honor the dollar as the world currency. And we will keep the U.S. dollar as the world's reserve currency. And it is currently under major siege. Many countries are leaving the dollar. They're not going to leave the dollar with me. I'll say, you leave the dollar. You're not doing business with the United States because we're going to put 100 percent tariff on your goods. I, I, I'm very much a traditionalist. I like staying with the dollar. You know that from when I was there. It's make, mm -hmm. make the dollar the choice. I hate when countries go off the dollar. I would not allow countries to go off the dollar because when we lose that standard, that will be like uh, losing a revolutionary war. That will be, that will be a hit to our country, just like losing a war. And we can't let that happen. And too many countries now, are fighting to get off the dollar. So, Andy, a former President Trump, again, one of the few politicians out there bringing up this issue, uh, being very vocal against it, bringing it up on the mainstream media. You know, can can the U.S. push back against this? I, I don't know that tariffs is the solution. Uh, l let's hear what you have to say about what we heard from Trump. You know, I, I, I listen to that, and on many levels, I think he's a very smart man, and I wish people would l would listen to him and his policies rather than to listen to his buffoonery when she, he says dumb things. And, and unfortunately, a lot of people <clears throat> have tuned him out. But he's very right. Marjorie Taylor Greene just said the exact same thing. She's kind of has buffoonery around right. her too, but she's saying again, not the most credible voice in politics. Uh, but it's go on. not. But but it's real, and and they understand it, and they acknowledge it. And I don't think that that sanctions and tariffs and a weak dollar are is the right path. But it's being acknowledged. In fact, it is the 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 weak dollar. It is the the tariffs, it is the sanctions, not the tariffs, but the sanctions, which, you know, in some respects is somewhat similar, um, that is, is forcing everyone away from the dollar. But it's also the gross irresponsibility of our fiscal policy. And, and what he's talking about also is not addressing our fiscal problem. You know, if you look at money creation running at 7% per year, on average, law of 70 seconds, 
would tell you that the dollar, if you take seven into 72, it tells you in 10.2 years, your principal doubles. Well, in this case, if it's 7% money creation, which is inflation, right? Not CPI rising prices, inflation is inflating the money supply. We inflate the money supply by money creation and 7% is conservative. That would tell you that 10.2 years ago, the dollar was worth twice what it is today. We've lost half of our purchasing power and gold was $1,200 10 years ago. It's 2,600 and change now. Did gold go up or did the dollar go down? So you have to understand that by continuing to to mismanage the dollar through massive fiscal irresponsibility and, and brain dead monetary policy, where we are creating a trillion dollars in debt every 90 days, roughly, that's part of the equation too. You can't just tell people to use a currency because when you talk about it in terms of goods and services that are being sold for a depreciating currency, one that goes around weaponizing its use. Well, if you don't do this, then this, that's not the way to do it. And and although I think acknowledging it is the first step, mm. I don't know that his policies can stop this. In fact, by taking the same path that we have, low interest rates, weak dollar, sanctions and weaponization, you're probably not going to achieve what you want to achieve. But I will say this, at least he acknowledges it. And I respect him for that. Because I don't think people quite understand, like you said, losing a revolutionary war, it, it will be a religious experience in this country if indeed we do. And you could argue we are losing it little by little, where right. a few years ago it was 70 plus percent of global reserves, it's now 58 percent and falling. And so, look, I think if he doesn't win, there are bigger problems. To me, What the reason I want him to win has less to do with fixing the ills of, of our currency management or mismanagement, that that's one issue. But it's more along the lines of getting our house in order here and restore, restoring American ideals. And that, I think, when people, little boys and girls who grew up wanting to wear Levi's jeans and listen to rock and roll and come to this country are questioning, do I want to do that anymore? Is it really the land of opportunity? Is it the land of of equality, of, of, of freedom of expression, you know, with the censorship and all of the nonsense that we've seen. I hope, hope, hope that that goes away. And I think there's a better chance of that happening with him. That's the first step. Then you clean up your monetary problems and your fiscal irresponsibility. But the thing is this, is this country ready to to do that, to to pay, you know, to to choose austerity over inflation, to tighten our belt, to live within our means and to respect the privilege of being the world reserve currency. We have done everything but respect that privilege. And that's the problem. Have we already crossed that Rubicon? Is there a way back? Maybe, but it isn't through threats, sanctions, tariffs, weaponization, and mismanagement of fiscal and monetary policy. Those aren't being addressed. Certainly not enough, but at least this is the first step in the process by saying, yeah, co countries are leaving. We better do something about it. And we can go from there. Yeah, at least, you know, as we said, former President Trump is acknowledging this. He's talking about it. Uh, and tariffs on countries, how does that align with the idea of onshoring? Because that's also part of the plan, right? To make the United States more independent from a manufacturing capacity. There has been this idea to onshore. And I guess that's why Vance, to some degree, wants to have a, a, a weaker dollar. Um, but tariffs in other countries, I mean, what would that mean? What would that mean for inflation? What would that mean for the onshoring uh, idea, assuming that that's an avenue pursued as a way to prevent this? It's just going to make products that much harder to get, uh, that much more expensive. Uh, it's going to hurt the American people. Yes, it would hurt the countries that manufacture these products, but we are a country with massive trade imbalance, meaning you know, we're buying yeah. everyone else's stuff. And, and if there's less incentive to sell it here, you know, let's not forget that, that the BRICS countries in and of themselves at this point already represent a higher portion of global GDP and of human population. You throw into it the Belt Road Initiative countries, the Shanghai Cooperation countries, the Eurasian Economic Union countries, all of these, which are many of the same countries or, or have the same ideals, or hedging that way, you're talking 80%, 90% of human population at some point, 
we end up cutting off our nose to spite our face. It is even looking at the SCO, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, where the whole premise of the Belt Road Initiative, we come in, we industrialize you, we help you achieve your, you know, to bring your country up in the standard of living and for it, we get a little piece. It's a cooperative measure. The way the bricks are put together is all about cooperation in terms of, of wanting to be part of the group, not beholden to any one country. Everyone has equal say. Even in their settlement currency, it's not one monopolar entity. And so, you know, being the world reserve currency is a privilege. And you wonder, did Jared Bernstein really, is it true that he didn't want, he, he advocates for the loss of the reserve standard? Is that what we're trying to do? I don't know. And all I can simply say to you is that um, if we lose it, it's a very, very big problem. And I don't think the way to retain it is through threats. It starts with getting our financial house in order and incentivizing countries to want to hold our treasuries and want to hold our, our currency. And that's why when you look, if, if Trump were to win, I do believe that Judy Shelton would be his nominee to run the Fed. And she advocates for a gold standard. She also advocates for, she says, who in their right mind would buy a 30-year treasury? I mean, why would anyone earning 4% or 5% when, when inflation is running and money creation is running higher than that. Let's not even acknowledge the, the fallacy of the BIS. It should be just take the I or the BLS and take the L out of the BLS and call it what it is, BS or the CP lie. It's all a bunch of nonsense. They lie to, 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 to adhere to this inflationary agenda. But putting it all together, why would anyone want to hold our treasuries? Judy says, well, we should, the only way you'll get people to countries to want to buy our treasuries is to make it redeemable in gold. And so, yeah, I, I think that, I do think that they understand what's coming, but in order to to make people want to or countries want to use the dollar, have it be the reserve currency, certainly the infrastructure is better than anything else out there. Everyone always says the cleanest shirt and the dirty laundry hamper. Fine. I agree with that for now. But at some point, like, why would you want to sell your oil or your commodities for a dollar that is being depreciated and weaponized? and inflated away for a country that is lost ideologically right. and, 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 and has its culture whitewashed. All of this stuff together, we have to start by cleaning up our own house and by getting our monetary and fiscal house in order. And he's not addressing that. And that's, that's one thing that makes me nervous. Certainly going at it through a coercive uh, approach, I don't think is the right approach either. But like I said, you know, they always say the first step to um, fixing a problem is acknowledging it. Well, he's acknowledged it. Now, hopefully, cooler heads and smarter minds prevail and they figure out a way to, to in a cooperative manner, that the world embraces. What, what? And I think that starts with, with making the institutions, the FBI, the judicial system, the electoral system, all of this stuff, make it the envy of the world again instead of the laughing stock, as we kind of sort of are right now. Well, what about non-cooperative uh, measures. What about coercive measures? You know, military might, and I've brought this uh, up before when we've chatted. I mean, we've talked about weaponizing uh, currencies. What about using weapons? You know, when all else fails, they, they take you to war. Is that something that you think, you know, could be on the horizon? Like the, the way the dollar became the global reserve currency was after the U.S., helped defeat uh, the Nazis in World War II and, and the Axis. That's how, through flexing military might and power, that's how it got that exorbitant privilege, which arguably has been abused, as we've discussed. Do you see a military pushback against this? Only if they're complete and total morons and, and idiots uh, in a world where BRICS has three of the four largest nuclear arsenals on the planet. What would be the point of doing that? It's a no-win situation, and um, no, I don't. And I mean, if God help us, <clears throat> if that's their solution, I know Gerald Salente always says, "When all else fails, take them to war." Yeah, I get it. It's a different world right now, and yeah. um, it's a different world that is far more advanced and and technologically advanced, and weapons that are a whole hell of a lot more frightening than they ever were. And and this is a situation where I think if they chose that path, it would be as foolish as can be. For example, you look at all our aircraft carriers, which are completely and totally no longer really viable in a world where you have 
drones that cost a few hundred or a few thousand dollars that can that, that have to be shot down by missiles out of an aircraft carrier that cost two or three million dollars a piece. There was a French uh, frigate that that was helping the blockade in, um, in in the Red Sea had to turn around and go back to France because the drones that were being fired at them from from Houthi and the Blowfish were um, were they they exhausted everything they had and these drones were just tiny little bits of money and they spent millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars on these yeah. sitting ducks that are sitting there shooting weapons at them so it's a different world right now and i think military is not the approach to take i don't and especially when you realize that you have china russia iran uh, india all of these countries that if they did coalesce I mean, even look at the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. It's the largest yeah. regional military group on the planet. You don't want to go down that road. That is, at that rate, we all got bigger problems to deal with. Who cares what gold and silver are valued at? Put your head between your legs and, you know, kiss your you-know-what goodbye. God forbid. Uh, God forbid. No, I think that's that's not a plan, not a good plan at all. Sir, I'm certainly not advocating for that. Hootie and the Blowfish, a way to make light of a very serious <laughs> matter, uh, Andy. You almost Inter have to nowadays, or you end up crying because everything is gallows so, so humor. maddening. I always say I have gallows humor. You know, it's my Freudian defense mechanism of choice. Always make a joke, and the more dire the circumstances, uh, the, uh, the more I tend to joke. Uh, but on a serious matter, of course, is the gold price. And I do want to get back to what that means. But let's bring it back to this meeting in terms of what you actually expect to hear before we get into gold price and implications there what do you actually expect to come out of this particular gathering october 22nd to 24th i think the mistake that was made last time michelle was that there were too many expectations made and and there were there were too many you know james rickards is such a smart man and and i and i talked with him a month before the the um the the meeting in, in Johannesburg, and I agreed with everything he said. I do think the SCO and, and the Eurasian Economic Union will join BRICS. And what did we see? The, the president of Belarus, uh, a European country, calling for these two uh, entities to join the BRICS. Uh, he talked about a common currency, and none of these things happened. And, and there was, you know, there was great disdain for that. And I think that it's about managing expectations. I think that all of these things are going to happen, including everything he said. Does it happen next week? Maybe, maybe not. But the trend is in motion. And it, it seems to me that the BRICS understand uh, just giving just enough information is enough for them rather than being fully transparent about everything until they are at a place um, in every single metric to be able to flip the switch and say, here, here's what it is. So I think we'll have greater clarity. We'll have greater clarity on, on who and how many countries have formally applied. I think they will broach the subject of a common settlement currency, and they will talk about that. I think that we'll see things that, that will add clarity, but I don't think perhaps that there'll be anything completely and totally defining. And if there is, I'll be pleasantly surprised. I don't expect them to come out and say, yes, we're going to issue the unit currency 100% here it goes. But I do think they'll say we have gone to great lengths to to come to a conclusion that a new common settlement currency is called for. We've done great work on its development. We will continue to work on it with the intention of implementing it very soon. To me, that's more probable than then giving us a concrete pathway to, um, you know, to, to what's coming. But clarity would be my, my, my guess and maybe something more. But to rely on that and be upset if it doesn't happen, you end up turning away from what's really important and not acknowledging the progression that continues each year and each month and each day. Uh, and that, that part is undeniable. So whether or not we get concrete answers or just some clarity, I guess, is debatable. And I would just simply say everything Jim said last year will happen. Does it happen yeah. this year? Don't know, but it's going to happen. That I do believe. Yeah, slowly then suddenly, as, as you like to say. Um, little by well, little, then all at once. Logarithmic decay. That is my, that is my saying. That is That's the next you, tattoo I'm going to get on my arm. <laughs> I have the periodic table of elements on, on the arm already, and gold and silver and platinum and palladium. I get a lot of, a lot of heat for that. Logarithmic but, uh, decay. Um, logarithmic decay is the next one. I'm personally not a fan of tattoos, but, you know, you do as you will. 
Uh, <laughs> Andy, speaking of gold, and again, I, I want to bring up an interesting point because, you know, we talked about all of these ambitions and that's fantastic, but the current gold price does not, in fact, provide enough liquidity for Enbridge nope. and the unit to fully roll out. For example, you know, Luca Groman points out that when the petrodollar came to be in the 1970s, oil had to, the oil price had to more than 3x to provide enough liquidity for the US dollar. That was then, and, and that was oil. So what does this mean for gold? Just the idea of them looking to do this. Yeah, it means that it's it needs to be higher in terms of its dollar <laughs> price for sure. I mean, and we've had the head of the Dutch National Bank talk about this for quite some time. And ironically, in fact, you can't make it up. Michelle Gold has held on central bank balance sheets and accounts called the gold revaluation account. And, you know, the head of the Dutch National Bank says, look, we got all this money in the revaluation account that we currently cannot offset against our liabilities. But why don't we revalue the price of gold and do just that? Because in Europe, gold is on everyone's balance sheet at 35 bucks an ounce. In the U.S., it's 42.22. I would guess they valued it last and did some legal declaration sometime in the early 70s, right after they set it free from its $35 an ounce price. But that is what it is on the books of the U.S. government. And, you know, it makes a lot of sense, actually. And we saw that with Roosevelt over my shoulder there. That's what he did. He confiscated gold. He revalued it, and and by forty percent by depreciating the dollar, and it takes on a greater significance in my mind when we see Cynthia Loomis, the, the senator from Oklahoma or from uh, Wyoming, who got up on stage at the Bitcoin conference uh, just a couple months ago in Tennessee, where Trump said, "Yeah, I want to build a Bitcoin strategic account," um, and she said, "Yeah, I want to to float a bill." that revalues the gold that the, the tre Fed is holding on behalf of the Treasury and to a level high enough to buy Bitcoin for this, this account. And, you know, in a world where, and, and by the way, Luke Groman is one of the smartest human beings on the planet. I, I try and follow everything that he says, and I agree with him. Uh, but uh, in a world where Bitcoin and, you know, uh, Michael Saylor, I think his, I've watched that interview you did with him. He, he'd be the first one to tell you it goes to 150,000 or 200,000 or a million, right? So why can Bitcoin go to 150,000, but gold can't? Why do we think that's okay and the other isn't? And I would just simply say, you put gold at $150,000 an ounce, as crazy as that sounds, your balance sheet now is pristine, it goes from putrid to pristine like that. And, and, and who's to say we couldn't do it? We'll just tell every country on the planet, send us your gold, we'll buy it. We'll pay 150000 an ounce for it. That is what it is. I mean, in China right now, silver is 4 bucks an ounce higher than it is in the West. That is what it is if you can deliver it there. My point is, if they did that, and they did that, it would behoove who? Well, all the central banks, they're the ones buying it all. And if it is indeed going to be part of a new system, and we're trying to put all of these systems together, a common system, as we were talking about, wouldn't it benefit the common system if it's all going to be tied to gold and blockchain? Then it would benefit everyone. And now you not only have a balance sheet where all of your money is not going to, to, to exponentially increasing interest payments, but instead to maybe trying to pay down the debt. Yes, it creates inflation, but it will never come back down at that point. That's why guys like Jim Sinclair, God rest his soul, always said, Gold will go to a level no one thinks possible, and it will be pegged to a new system and never come down. I mean, I think that is what will happen. I think it's too hard to ignore. You know, Richard Russell always said, inflate or default, that's all the Fed can do. For the last four years, I said, find a villain, Xi Jinping and Open and, and, uh, and Putin and OPEC. They did it to us. And, and, and they incentivizing them to dump the dollar as the reserve currency. We've talked about what that looks like. But how about option four? Just simply revalue the gold holdings if they really are there, the 8,330 metric tons that haven't been audited forever, and revalue it to a level that then makes our balance sheet balanced with you know the, 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 the liabilities with our now higher asset level, and, and it's a different game. Could that happen? I think if, if Trump beats him to the punch, if Trump were elected and they beat him to the punch, beat the wet, the, the east or the south rather, the, the bricks to the punch of, of currency revaluation and tying it to gold. That is how it would give us, I think, an advantage. It would give us, um, it would neutralize perhaps much of the world's desire to move away if indeed we showed here's the new deal. We realize we've made a mistake. We realize we've 
kind of squandered our, our, the good graces of our foreign creditors, and we're going to make up for that by going this way because we've gone too far down the line to really pay it off. So we're going to revalue gold. We're going to honor that price. We're going to peg it to a new system, and it will be transparent for everyone to see these, these transgressions will never happen again. Would it work? Yeah, I think it would forestall a lot of you know, the ugliness that could happen as a result of, of the BRICS doing this first. So beat them to the punch. If you can't beat them, join them, but do it first. You're saying that that's also on the table. Well, remember, we've talked about the first interview I did with you, and you threw that at me like a curveball, and I somehow fortunately said, well, remember the report that just came out, and it came out right around the time we did that interview in January two years ago, the IMF saying gold as an international reserve currency, comma, a barbarous relic no more. You can mm -hmm. make a link to that report on this video just by Googling IMF and typing that report name in. And then later, earlier this year, Kristalina Georgieva, their head, said any CBDC not pegged to something is fiat. Well, why not use the only other tier one reserve asset? But in order to do it to a level sufficient, and keep in mind, when the Swiss had gold backing of their currency, they did it at 40%. That gives monetary fluidity that gives you the ability to 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 maneuver on a monetary level um, by having that 60 percent of of it not being backed by 60 percent so if it's at a level high enough and 40 percent backing and instead of making it redeemable to to every everyone like you and i you show its immutability on the blockchain and and this is kind of what they're trying to do on a larger scale with Embridge and and with the so, unit, uh, well, how do you to just show its veracity. The, how do you just revalue the price of gold? Uh, By devaluing like, the dollar no, and so, just so, saying so this is what it is. What, what do you say? You're the U.S. and you say an ounce of gold is now worth a hundred thousand dollars, and we'll pay you a hundred thousand dollars for an ounce yes, of gold. You just and, and, and assume that you know people accept that. Well, I mean, there would might be some pushback. Of course, but if we're willing to pay anyone who wants to sell us gold at 120,000 an ounce, isn't that what it really is at? I mean, to me, it is. Um, how did Roosevelt do it in '33 when gold was $20 an ounce, and and then all of a sudden he devalued the dollar, and now gold is $35 an ounce? That's a 40% revision. It is what it is. That's what we'll pay you for it. So if the central banks of the world have the ability to offload all of their gold to the to the Fed, and we'll pay them. Twelve hundred dollars, or thirteen hundred dollars, or whatever the number is, or excuse me, one hundred twenty thousand, one hundred thirty thousand, one hundred fifty thousand, whatever it well, is. Why, that why, is what it is. Why would they do that? Why, if they if they're planning this whole agenda, and we've explained how you know the dollar is losing its value, devalued, debased, excessive printing, fiat currency. Why would they do that? Who who's going to bring? Well, maybe in their it's vote? a new system. It's a new system. Who knows? Maybe no one. Maybe, I mean, any gold that is out there, the arbitrage would send it that way over time. And maybe it's a new system that the West is, is saying, look, here's our new system. It's pegged to gold. It will be, it will be immutable. It, it is, we will not denigrate the system the way that we've done before. You would get tons of arbitrage. You would have a lot of players that would send their gold just to make that, that, that spread. And it would just happen. And I think it would benefit all of the world's central banks to a degree. You're going to get inflation. You're going to get pushback. It, but nonetheless, I mean, I think it, it is highly probable. It is highly probable because immediately it offsets all of the balance sheets of all of the indebted countries. And if you realize that all of the, the central banks are buying gold and bringing it home, in one way or the other, it benefits all of them. So, look, it's, it's a Hail Mary pass, but either that or inflate or default – or go back to option three and just tell make everyone have no reason to hold our currency, to hold our treasuries and dump it and watch what happens. Either way, you're gonna to get to the same point. If you don't take care of this problem that is growing, either you inflate, you default, or option three and four, find a villain, or just revalue gold. And I think they can do that. It's the least painful of all of the options. and. You know, if that's what they're willing to pay, anyone that's willing to, to sell us their gold, then that is what the price is. Where, where does the U.S. stand in terms of ranking of its gold holdings from what we know? I mean, we're supposed to be number one at, at 8,300 metric tons. But guys like Alistair McLeod will tell you that he believes that China 
has five times that amount, over 40,000 metric tons yeah. that they produce over, you know, between three and 500 metric tons per year, every year that, that they are the largest producers and accumulators on the planet and not forthright about how much that they actually own. So again, who knows? Fort Knox hasn't been audited since I think 1953. But where did Saddam Hussein's gold go? Where did Gaddafi's gold go? Where did the 12 billion that the Ukraine sold to to fund the war? Where did that go? Where is all of that gold? Why are we not open about it? Why isn't China open about it? And if you think about it, if indeed all of the nations knew that gold was going to be revalued, the last thing they would ever want to do is be candid about what they're buying and how much they buy. It's just like Saudi Arabia buying 160 metric tons and not acknowledging it until they were caught by the import-export numbers. Right. They're all doing this. It's China flying around Latin America and buying up Dore and concentrate from the miners, as I've been told on multiple occasions from other mining executives, paying far more than the West will pay and bringing it home to refine it. Or the People's Liberation Army, when they buy it, it's not reported to the IMF the way it is when the PBOC buys it. There's a million ways around accumulating gold without being open about it. And I think that's indeed what they're all doing because it doesn't behoove any of them to be open about it until they pull back the curtain and say, here's what we have. And so, look, a lot of this is supposition. I'll give you that. And I, and, and, but a lot of it is also rooted in fact and common sense. And so if you want to fix a system that is broken, you can hyperinflate, you can default. Yep. And if this is an option that allows them the least painful way out, which also benefits a new system, a much higher gold price pegged. Um, to me, it just makes sense. So again, so, I guess well, over kind time, of, we'll what kind of price would we be looking at here to fix well, all the about issues? About a hundred. I think the number was every four thousand dollar increase in the price of gold gives a, a trillion dollars free and clear to the the, the tr Treasury General account. And Janet Yellen wouldn't even need to get congressional approval to do this. She would just tell her buddy Jerome, Jerome, jack up the price of gold. Here's what you're going to pay for it. And, you know, so the math, I think it's about 130, 140,000, and you could offset your balance sheet, at least the 35 trillion. Now, that we're not even talking about the unfunded liabilities, Medicare, Medicaid, government, military pensions, Social Security, but that's all owed to us. And if you go down a, a, a pathway of modern monetary theory, you know, that's, that's a whole different rabbit hole, but it's less a problem. More a problem if you want to retain the world reserve status. The only way that's ever going to happen is to have some form of, of, of a tether to the irresponsible mm. fiscal policy that we continue to, uh, to exhibit around the globe. So let's bring it back to the BRICS and this meeting, Andy, um, because we know, well, we have it on better authority that they are intending to do this, whereas, you know, what we've just said is the speculation could fix the problem. Um, Perhaps progress towards this is made at this meeting, no major announcement, although there are some reports that they're planning on launching uh, the unit in the second half of 2025. Give or take on the timing, what happens when this launches? What happens to the dollar? I explain how that all fits in with what we've discussed. Is the dollar being dethroned as the global reserve currency in terms of timing? When this eventually is, and maybe not that eventually, when this sooner or later does actually become official, assuming they do get their act together and do pull this off. Paint that picture for me. What happens then? All roads lead to much higher inflation, period. Unless we, but even if we beat them to the punch, all roads lead to inflation. And that, that's, that's kind of the pain that we're going to have to endure through, as a result of this gross negligence that we've exhibited through monetary and fiscal policy. And if indeed that this happens, that, that it is launched, I mean, what incentive do countries have to continue to stockpile dollars and that synthetic demand that we've enjoyed for 50 years of every country having to stockpile it to buy energy is gone. It's gone. And not only that, more importantly, is the treasury market. What incentive do people have to own treasuries that have been weaponized and are being, you know, you look at the price of gold, Michelle, it's doubled the performance of the 10-year treasury for 25 years with no counterparty risk. These are all factored into the equation. And so if it's a dumping of treasuries, if a dumping of dollars, and we go right back to that, that option three, incentivize the world to dump dollars and treasuries. They found a better system and they all dump them. And, you know, it's ironic that the lead economic advisor for the government advocates for this. We've gone over that a whole bunch, 
But if that happens, you now point to the villains that did this to us, and then you roll in. Here comes Lael Brainerd, number two, with her CBDC, and that's option two. You know, we the whole system got blown up. They did it to us, and now we issue a CBDC. And if you think about it, the 200 plus trillion in debt that we owe, most of it's owed to us. About seven trillion is owed to them. But Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, government, military, pensions, and all the people that have left the banks chasing yield, the massive amount of money in the money markets all invested in treasuries and, and the hedge funds and the banks all invested in treasuries. All of this money in treasuries, it's all owed to us. So resetting on us is a lot easier than resetting on all of them. And that's why that number three option has always made sense to me. Option four is kind of a new deal. And when Cynthia Loomis brought it up, I'm like, hmm, maybe they really are thinking of option four. But I think the most probable outcome is that if unless we beat them to the punch, that something happens where there is no longer an incentive to own dollars or treasuries, something we fostered um, and continue to do so by our negligence with, with fiscal policy and, and monetary policy. And when that happens, we point to them. They did it to us. And, right. and now this inflation, the tsunami of inflation that hits our shores, spikes interest rates to the moon. You can't have double-digit inflation and 5% interest rates. Your currency dies. So you reset the system. You blame them for doing it because interest rates spike to the moon. The banks that are over-leveraged and undercapitalized, the insurance companies, the, the real estate market, the bond market, the stock market, they all implode simultaneously. You issue your new CBDC pegged to gold, and there you are. I mean, it's what we've talked about before. To me, yeah. if I had a gun to my head, I'd say that's the most probable outcome unless we beat them to the punch and start being more forward thinking. But um, either way, there's pain. There has to be, we have to pay the bar tab, and there will be pain. And that pain could have been mitigated had we done all of this in 2008 when everything blew up and just got our fiscal house in order. Instead, we papered it over. We made it a whole lot worse. And now it's only going to be a, a, a more painful outcome in the end. Well, Andy, well, either way, there's, it's not pleasant. It's not pleasant. Reset the system um, with some kind of, you know, central bank digital currency in one form or another, which brings me to a question. We talked about this being all at the state level, right? What would it mean for individuals holding gold if this does now become the system and we've got this one world system and perhaps not a one world currency, but a one world system as we've discussed and gold is so central to all of that. Are, are they going to let individuals like you and I hold gold on an individual level? I mean, do you see that potentially being made illegal for individuals to hold? Again, no, would, hypothetically, would, so, just, you know, thinking out scenarios here. Well, can I just be candid? I would say the people who own gold are the pimple on the elephant's ass, Michelle. I mean, I really think that way. There's so few that we represent less than one half of 1%. The elephant doesn't own any gold whatsoever. And so I would like to hope that that would be the case. Eminent Domain says if indeed they do take our gold, you have to be justly compensated. That would suck. You'd have a lot of money in, in this whatever currency. But yeah, I mean, let's hope so. Uh, let's hope that they would allow us. Who knows? Um, I don't think that they would confiscate gold. I think if they do, it's, it's kind of checkmate. When you realize that SLV and GLD, you know, the largest stockpile of silver in the world, SLV held by JP Morgan and BlackRock, a company that paid a $920 million fine for manipulating the metals market. It'd be much easier to take all that silver without breaking any laws or infringing any civil liberties. And the same thing is true with GLD and the other ETFs that are held by these crooked cartel banks that are behind the price rigging, that are behind the suppression. Uh, it would be easier for them to take all of that gold and silver. And because the gold that all of us people in the United States hold represents less than a couple hours of spending by this government. So is that wishful thinking and, and, and hopium? Maybe. But uh, I would like to hope that they wouldn't come after us because if you want to retain that um, yeah. the illusion of being a, a center of free trade, even after a new system is put in, you can't activate eminent domain when you have countries like China telling their people to buy gold or Russia drops the, the, the uh, VAT tax telling their people to buy gold. You can't do that. And I think we represent such a tiny, tiny minority that it really wouldn't, the, the backlash would be counterproductive. Maybe I'm just being wishful, but um, I would like to hope not anyways. 
so so possible final, desperate governments do desperate things that's true so so final thoughts here on that note of the uh pimple on the elephant's back as you call it those of us that do hold gold your favorite on the channel i always like to read the comments from the viewers everybody appreciates your insight but then you do have the viewers that say oh andy's just talking his book he personally you know is a gold retailer you're just talking your book what what do you say to that that those people have never owned a company. Those people uh, are too cynical for their own good to realize that you can't run a business and, and, and do right by people, that, that there's a conflict there. They have to be mutually exclusive of one another. Mm -hmm. uh, the bigger, if I were being completely candid, if I were sitting having a beer with you and, and I were being completely candid, I'd say, look, I've done 10 billion in sales as a company. I don't need to put myself out here online and and be vilified by people. I don't need to do that. I do it because I, I we all need to meet our maker someday, let's just simply say. And I feel I've done my part. I've tried my best to, to get this information out. Yes, it benefits my business. Yes, YouTube has changed my life. But, you know, being recognized the way that I am and saying the thing, I try to be respectful when I speak about the U.S. government and when I speak about all of the problems that we have, I try to say it from the standpoint of, of, of a kid growing up in the 70s coming from nothing, literally nothing. And I say it before, my dad's middle name is Miles and his friend who lent us 60 grand in 1989 before the internet to start a company on a wing and a prayer in an office the size of a, cl a closet. His middle name was Franklin. No one ever said all that stuff to me along the way. YouTube changed all that. But along with going on YouTube, if you don't do your homework, you look like an idiot. And that's the last thing. And in the process of doing my, my homework, I've stumbled across all this stuff that scares the heck out of me. And at least I have a track record over the last four years and almost 4,000 YouTube videos that pays homage to that um i would be lying if i said it doesn't benefit my business it does but by the same token it comes at at the expense of a lot of other things and and i think about that stuff too so no I, i'm long past talking my book now i'm trying to do the right thing and and build a legacy for my family and, and for my company and help as many people as I possibly can and do it the right way. Because you know what, if you're a fraud and you come on shows like yours, you're easily outed. And I wouldn't be asked to come back on your show and I wouldn't be listened to or followed or watched. At least what I'm saying, look, I'm not Peter Schiff, guy's brilliant and, 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 and hell of an economist. What I am is someone who cares and tries to be authentic and uh, does his homework. I try to outwork people, and, and I do in many cases, and take it for what it's worth. But uh, start something yourself, build a business, and realize real quickly that, you know, you don't have to be a jerk right. in order to get to the top. And, and that's kind of the way I'd leave it. And, and Andy, as I've said uh, so far... <laughs> Not that I'm rooting for it. And that's a point I'd like to make on many levels. I know you're not rooting for this either, right? This is not exactly what you hope would happen. But, but so far, so much of what you said is playing out in the way that you said it would play out. But it's not necessarily something that you want to happen. It scares the hell out of me. And I don't want it to happen. My 17-year-old daughter just walked in and walked out. And the last thing I want is for her to grow up in a world that um is scary and lacks opportunity and you know i mean no i don't want it to happen and, and quite frankly the fact that it has I, i'd rather be wrong in everything i said i'd rather be known as a guy who was wrong yeah as, as sad as that sounds because what does it say for the world we all live in i i'm a patriot michelle this country's given me more than i deserve to have ever gotten i'm the least likely person to have ever achieved what i have and i owe it to being born in this country and um, and and grown up at a time where American ideals of hard work, of family, of honesty, of integrity, those things mean everything to me. That's why in, in 35 years, we've never had a customer complaint ever at my company. You Google it, you won't find it. To me, I take that with, that is one of the greatest honors that I've ever achieved in my life. Build a business that's done 10 billion in sales without a customer complaint. That says something to me. So yeah, I, um, I don't want to be right. I have a feeling that 
it is going to happen because a lot of this stuff I've talked about has happened and it's accelerating. May not be the way that I think or the way I've tried to um, to uh, to enunciate it or to explain it, but I think some derivative of it. And if I were just going to boil it down into one phrase, it would be that what we know of as the dollar and of the U.S. hegemony is on its way out. In fact, I would say go as far as say the hegemony is gone. The supremacy isn't. And what is left of the supremacy is waning. And, and, and you know, um, instead of clinging to the privilege of being the world reserve currency, doing everything we can to maximize our view, our viewpoint, or, or the way we are viewed globally, it seems we're doing the opposite on every level here at home, monetarily, fiscally, and around the globe. In every single way, we're just being as stupid as stupid can be. And that's why I, I'm very fond of, of this little trite statement saying, is it too stupid to be stupid? Mm -hmm. Could this all be thought out? That option three, incentivize the world to help us reset the system and then have a villain to point to that creates a, 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 a country that is willing to accept a CBDC that most of us don't want to take. But as a last resort, if you have to, well, you will. And it's much easier to do that than to say we screwed everything up with monetary policy and fiscal policy and, and brain dead management on, on the governmental level. They did it to us. And that's an easier path, an easier pill to swallow, I think. And hope I'm wrong, but it just seems every day we're getting closer to that kind of an outcome. Well, I also hope you're wrong, but I hope you'll come back on and give us more of your insights because, yes, uh, and, well, they have been proven to be so far pretty accurate as this uh, situation has been playing out and a lot faster than we've anticipated, perhaps. But, Andy, always a pleasure. Thank you so much for sharing your insights and your information with us. We really appreciate I hope, it. I hope, I hope the other shows that I go on aren't listening, but you're my favorite show. You're the most prepared person that ever interviews me. I will always come back on when asked. You won't have to twist my arm. But look, there'll be a lot to talk about real soon. And uh, I'm, I'm always waiting to hear back from you and, and to come back on at, at, at the moment's notice. But Michelle, it's always great to see you. Thanks for having me. And I will look forward to picking back up right where we left off again next time. But I hope you and everyone else out there stays well. And uh, until next time. Thank you, Andy. And I, I take that accolade uh, very humbly, but very proudly as well, being uh, the favorite show for you to be on. So thank you again, Andy Sheckman. Appreciate it. Thanks, Michelle. And thanks as always to our viewers and a big thanks to our sponsor, Goldback. For our viewers not yet familiar with this easily portable form of gold, Goldbacks are physical, interchangeable gold currency made of real 24 karat gold. Now these are gold notes with real gold woven inside. So you have the gold vacuum deposited using state-of-the-art proprietary technology, making them transportable. And with Goldbacks, you can help protect your wealth against fiat currency debasement and devaluation through the stability of gold because they are made with real 24 karat gold. So they appreciate along with the price of gold. And Goldbacks allow you to own and spend gold in small interchangeable increments. You can buy Goldbacks starting for as little as about five US dollars. Goldbacks can also be used as real money from small to large transactions. There are over five states where goldbacks can be used to pay for goods and services from a growing list of 2,000 businesses where goldbacks are accepted as payment for goods, anything from a cup of coffee to a pair of shoes to services like getting your car repaired. And there's also a way to earn interest on the goldbacks that you own paid in goldbacks. And you can get all the details on goldback.com. So if you want to diversify the way you hold your gold and get some goldbacks, there's a link in the description of this video with where and how you can buy your goldbacks. So make sure to check that out as usual. Thank you for checking us out. If you haven't yet subscribed, please do so. And as always, Leave your comments. Feel free to praise wine or just opine. We love hearing from you and we do actually read and pay attention to those comments. For me, Michelle McCory and the rest of the Kitco team, thanks again for watching and we'll see you soon. On the Spot with Michelle McCory is brought to you by Goldback, inflation resistant 24 karat gold currency. Protect your purchasing power, grow your wealth annually, and spend at over 2,000 businesses. Learn where to get goldbacks at goldback.com.